So I'm going to ask for committee members to unmute themselves so that we can do a quick round of introductions. Um, Chris, Stacia, Shannon, and Beth, if you're just great. Welcome. Okay. So if everyone's ready, I think we can get rolling. Um, thank you for participating and welcome to um, the second virtual version of our um, Western Mass Historical Commission uh, collaborative meetings that we do about quarterly. Um, Berkshire Regional Planning Commission is pleased to be hosting again and pleased to be presenting um, a featured uh, project of the Berkshire Scenic Railway. And uh, Jay Green, uh, past president of Berkshire Scenic is here to present to us. Um, before we get started with that first presentation, I'd like to ask committee members to briefly introduce themselves and I'll just do a roll call for that. Um, Stacia, if you could start. Um, yes, uh, happy to be participating um, in this meeting this morning. I'm Stacia Kaplinson. I work for Preservation Massachusetts. We are the statewide um, nonprofit historic preservation organization. We promote the use and, and um, reuse of historic buildings. Um, and we welcome members. Um, we have a website we, with lots and lots of information, um, as well as a Facebook page and um, all kinds of ways to, to connect. Uh, my area is, the, uh, is central and western Massachusetts, so reach out to me. Great. And Stacia does a tremendous amount of work to get these events organized, whether they're in person or online. So thank you for all of that work. Uh, moving next to Chris Skelly. Hi everybody, I'm Chris Skelly from Massachusetts Historical Commission and I'm the Director of Local Government Programs and I work with all the local historical commissions around the state, um, just providing assistance wherever I can. Uh, and I am very happy to be partnering with Berkshire Regional Planning Commission and the other regional planning agencies in Western Mass uh, to provide some training for local commissions, but also the general public as well. It's been a great partnership uh, with the regional planning agencies and with uh, Preservation Mass as well with, with uh, Stacia. Great. Um, and Shannon. Yes, I'm Shannon Walsh. I'm the Historic Preservation Planner for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. We primarily work with Hamden and Hampshire counties, but we work outside of those counties as well. And uh, we're happy you could join us today. And Beth. Hi, I'm Beth Janini. I work for the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. Um, we are the regional planning agency for uh, Franklin County, and we are just thrilled. We, it's been a great partnership to work um, with this group to bring presentations about preservation topics. Um, I think we're maybe going on like our third or fourth year with this, and it's been a really great resource, um, and we just look forward to continuing. Great, um, and I'm Laura Brennan from Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. Um, I'm a senior planner for community and economic development and um, very lucky to be assigned to the historic preservation um, projects when they come along. And we work closely in our region with um, PVPC especially um, to do more in-depth work um, when projects come up. So. Uh, that's a, been a great partnership that we've had for quite a while. Um, I'd like to move right on into presentations. You'll need to give me a moment to share a second screen that I'm working from here. Um, and we're going to first start with Jay Green of Berkshire Scenic Rail Railway Museum. And I'm going to pull up his slides and get this into slideshow mode. And Jay will be letting me know when a slide should move along. Sure. Okay. All right, well, good morning, everybody. I'm Jay Green. Uh, I'm originally from Chicopee Holyoke, moved out to the Berkshires in 2005. So I am a true native Western uh, Massachusetts resident. So I've, I've included a little bit about the uh, Pioneer Valley in my presentation today for all of our Western Mass uh, folks here. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a brief snapshot of the Berkshire Scenic Railway Museum, how we're organized, what our funding source is, our quick collections policy. Then I've got about three particular uh, 
historic preservation projects that I, I think you all find quite interesting. Uh, Berkshire Scenic is a very dynamic organization. It is not, uh, it does not fit squarely in a square hole or in a round hole. I think that's important as we, we go through this today so you can see really how sophisticated, difficult, and expensive it is to operate a living railroad museum. So go ahead, uh, Laura, next slide, please. Yep. Berkshire Scenic was founded in, in 1984. Our mission is to preserve the diverse railroad history of the Berkshires, and we do have a countywide presence here in Berkshire County. Uh, we have a, our main facility headquarters is in Lenox. We have a facility in Stockbridge, Stockbridge Historic Railroad Station, and now the town of Adams, where I am presently town administrator. Our mission and our charter has not really changed since 1984. We were organized as a 501c3 educational nonprofit. We're probably one of the last remaining organizations that can function as all volunteer, and I can tell you that that is slowly eroding. It's becoming very difficult to operate uh, as an all-volunteer organization, and in fact, it hampers our ability to evolve and progress. Uh, we are governed by a nine-member volunteer board of directors. We have about 20 to 40 active volunteers with a variety of interests, skills, and engagement level. That is also quite a, a challenge in order to get the, the right people to achieve some of the, the diverse tasks that we have based on our collections inventory. The primary source of funding for us has always been revenue generated from excursion and tourist train rides. This has required substantial public support for access to the Berkshire Railroad infrastructure. Uh, additional funding sources include memberships, grants, and donations. That last bullet point we have never admittedly been very good at at all. Um, we just don't do grants, and well, I shouldn't say grants, but we don't do donations and memberships well. Uh, we finally acquired a volunteer last year who's been steadily doing that, so we've, we've seen much greater progress with that. The museum's income is really uh, sourced from that excursion tourist train rides. Berkshire Scenic evolved not as a static museum, but really the museum, the historical experience has always been that, that train ride using historic equipment. So it's been imperative that we have a very good public relationship with our elected officials, the communities that we're in, in order to achieve public support to access that, that public infrastructure. It's, it's been quite a challenge, uh, but it's unique, and when all the pieces come together, it really makes a, a nice, robust historical experience that's living, breathing, hearing, uh, and it affects all the senses and, and really captures uh, the interest of a younger generation. Go ahead, Laura. So just very quickly here on their left, we just have one of our, uh, just gives you a snapshot of the, the diversity that we have. We wear historic uniforms. Uh, we have to go through our training sessions. Our training sessions are not just nuts and bolts of railroad, but we try to impart upon some historical significance of the era that we're trying to replicate, the heyday of Western Massachusetts railroading. Uh, all of our equipment is vintage. We have no modern equipment. Uh, most of our collection is operable, which requires a substantial amount of training uh, and mechanical uh, repair and maintenance to keep the equipment going. Uh, and I'm proud to say up in that right hand picture, we have two of our, our younger volunteers um, who have some um, machinist skill sets and uh, mechanical engineering skill sets. So we're trying to recruit some of our, our younger folks uh, who have that interest in historical preservation, but also getting dirty with it, the, kind of the mechanical side of it. The right-hand picture will repeat a little later on in my presentation, uh, but that is our newest project. Uh, that is downtown Adams, Massachusetts. That is our vintage 1952 Bud Rail diesel car that were utilized uh, on those very tracks for many years, uh, and that is our boarding platform at Adams. And I'll, I'll give you a very high-level review of that project, but we're, we're proud of it, and it's a, a great shot, particularly this time of year with the, uh, the trees. Okay, Laura? So the collection of BSRM, I'm going to break this down into three categories for you. Uh, the first one is physical property. What does Berkshire Scenic Rail Museum own? We own Stockbridge Railroad Station. That's our newest uh, acquisition as of last year. Linux Railroad Station, we've owned that since 1985. We have an equipment display and physical storage yard at Linux uh, property. We have a restoration shop at Linux. We have a trackage rights agreement with MassDOT on the Adams branch for physical operation of our vintage equipment. And we have a newly constructed passenger boarding platform and station building for passenger services, restrooms, ticketing, gift shop, and historical exhibits at, at Adams. The upper left-hand photograph that you see is the brand new boarding platform built in conjunction with the town of Adams. 
Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see the uh, artist con concept for that, and I'm proud to say that most of that has been built at this time. Bottom left is uh, Stockbridge Station circa 2010, and on the right is Linux Station circa 2006-2007 uh, uh, era. Next slide, Laura. We also, in addition to having physical property, we also have uh, our collection of equipment, what would be a railroad museum without the actual railroad pieces themselves. We have over 20 pieces of rolling stock. Our mixture of equipment represents our collections policy that we've pretty much been uh, devoted to, and we've had to make some hard decisions, but we feel it's in the best interest of having a collection that's manageable. A lot of railroad museums tend to take whatever they can get, and then they realize that their preservation, rehabilitation, and their maintenance budget is far less than, than what their collection entails and they turn into really a rusty junkyard. We've worked very hard not to do that. Uh, we've wanted to be sure that most of the pieces we acquire have some semblance of uh, regional historical purpose. Number two would be a practical or functional use, that is the acquisition cost of it, the maintenance cost of it, the revenue generation, et cetera. Best example I can give you is the passenger cars that we use. They were not necessarily historic to Western Massachusetts, but they were available in the mid-1980s at a very reduced cost. Uh, they were built in the 19-teens and early 1920s. They're indestructible. They've served us well, uh, and they're not complicated. So that's been the majority of the passenger car fleet for Berkshire Scenic. That's an example of that type of, of acquisition. The bottom slide that you see there, uh, the bottom picture rather, Boston and Maine 1113, that photograph was taken just up the road here in North Adams, Mass. Uh, that's a vintage 1941 uh, General Motors diesel locomotive that eventually made its way uh, Mechanicville, New York, North Adams, Mass, through that, and then eventually landed at the Mount Tom Power Plant. When the Mount Tom Power Plant was shut down, uh, we reached out to the uh, power company in the scrapper, and we were able to acquire that locomotive uh, about one day before the touch uh, torches uh, were to cut it up. Uh, that was an unplanned acquisition. We've successfully acquired it, moved it from Holyoke, brought it back to North Adams, and in fact, uh, this weekend we're going to try to complete some diesel prime mover work on it and restart it, and our goal is to restore it to that uh, paint job that you see, that, that livery, and use it uh, to uh, demonstrate our historic trains here uh, between Adams and North Adams. So that's, the, that's number one. That's an example of that. Uh, and lastly, will acquire something that tells a unique story about railroading, something that engages public interest. Example would be that Fairmont track car that you see in the yellow there. Uh, that's something that kids like to see uh, that was it's no longer used on the railroad, uh, but it's fun. Uh, there is some level of historic uh, precedent for it in Western Mass, maybe not a specific piece of equipment, but again, it tells a unique story. It's, in, it's engaging. Uh, the other picture you see of that Bud car there, number 42 with the big NH on it, uh, we've actually acquired that unit from the Fall River and Old Colony Railroad Museum. Uh, that is now at Lenox, and that's an, uh, an exact piece that was once utilized between uh, Pittsfield and Danbury, Connecticut. In fact, if you watch the uh, program Last Train to Pittsfield, which has been uh, promulgated lately by the train campaign uh, that was filmed along the Berkshire line, uh, that unit uh, or a sister unit like it was, was highlighted in there. So that was a, a recent acquisition as well. And then up above uh, is a picture of a New Haven trail liner caboose. Um, we actually have that physical caboose that you see in that advertisement. So that gives you a quick snapshot of our uh, equipment collection. Okay, Laura. Uh, next, quickly, is our archives collection. So the railroad uh, is very diverse. We've talked about physical property. We've also talked about our heavy equipment. But there's also a lot of smaller things about railroading, too. The middle upper picture where you see that baggage wagon, that's the interior of our historic 1902 Lenox station. Uh, there's a lot in there. You'll see the, uh, the milk canisters. All that tells a story about what materials and people were shipped uh, on the railroad. So we have a lot of our ephemeral, et, et cetera, uh, that we have on display as best we can on the walls. Uh, and we try to be as bright and visible with our, our passive exhibits. We don't have the ability to be fancy. Uh, but we, we do want to be engaging to some, some degree. Left-hand side is just an example of some railroad equipment. That's a, 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 uh, a signal mast tower that was recently restored that was out in front of Lenox Station. We've had to restore the glass. We had to put it back in physical operation. So we also achieve those types of restorations. 
course, we have paperwork. There's an example on the bottom left. We have a tremendous amount of advertisements, timetables, et cetera. Uh, the railroad runs on coffee, paper, and rumor. Uh, we can't collect necessarily the rumor, but we certainly collect the, uh, the paper from it as well. The middle picture at the bottom is what we call our Yokin Block Station exhibit. Uh, Yokin Brook ran through Lenox. It was once a physical location on the Berkshire Line Railroad. We've replicated that building. I think I have a slide of it a little later on in the presentation, but that is the interior. Everything you see in that picture is authentic railroad. It is from a variety of different regional railroad locations, with the exception of that large cabinet on the left that we had built specifically to replicate uh, a piece that we really liked but couldn't, couldn't find. Uh, and folks are able to walk right in there and, and take a look and, and actually handle a lot of that equipment under one of our docents uh, and be able to get a really sense of, of what a railroad uh, infrastructure looks like. It's a very immersive experience. The last two pictures on the right is another example of what we do. We do collect vintage photographs. That's a, a view of Pittsfield, circa uh, probably mid-1950s, late 1950s. You'll see two locomotives in that picture, one sitting on the turntable at Pittsfield. That's an Alco RS3. That was uh, a quintessential locomotive that was utilized on the Berkshire line. We've acquired an RS3. And the unit behind it that you can see with the rounded nose, another uh, a very common locomotive style uh, utilized by General Motors that was also used on the Berkshire line beginning in the late 1950s all the way through until the early 1970s. We've acquired one of those as well. That's called an FL9M. At the bottom, in addition to paper, in addition to physical uh, artifacts, in addition to equipment and photographs, we're also trying to archive the stories. The bottom picture on the right you see is uh, our museum curator, Brent Betty, interviewing Mr. Pete McLaughlin. Pete's a member of the Danbury Railroad Museum, but Pete uh, started at a very young age on the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad and operated freight and passenger trains almost all the way through to the end of his career on the Berkshire Line. We're trying to document these stories as well from Pete. Uh, he's a great storyteller. He just has that natural organic ability. But we're trying to document uh, these experiences as well. So we hired a, a company to come in and to document stories from Pete. And, and as time permits, we'll put these together for access uh, eventually to our collections. But that gives you a pretty good snapshot of the diverse preservation activities that we do. Go ahead, Laura. So very quickly, Massachusetts uh, railroads, you can see here, I know we're going to speak a little bit about Palmer today, of course, and uh, East Hampton. You'll see that uh, this is a Rand McNally railroad map. You'll see that there's a lot of railroad history here in western Massachusetts. We have a, a lot of stories to tell, not just in the Berkshires, but also in the Pioneer Valley where I'm from. The, uh, western Massachusetts was served by three railroads, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford coming up essentially from Connecticut the Boston and Albany, the New York Central that ran from uh, Terminus in Boston all the way across east-west. Uh, that was a line that went through Palmer, goes through Springfield Union Station, over the Connecticut River, up through the Berkshires, hits Pittsfield, and then on into Albany and all points west. And of course, we also have the storied Boston and Main Ridge Railroad, which primarily served the northern tier of Massachusetts, and then down um, up over into North Adams, up into Mechanicville, and then um, connected with all western points at Mechanicville. You'll see in the upper left-hand corner, North Adams, Adams in, in Cheshire and Pittsfield. So Berkshire Scenic is uh, located in Lenox. So you see we try to interpret all of that, that area there, uh, but also the Hoyoke, Chicopee, Westfield area. Every now and then we have some, some folks that visit us and we try to interpret that area. So uh, western Massachusetts is a very rich railroad history. There's a lot to talk about, um, and we do our best to try to preserve all of it. Go ahead, Laura. I just wanted to give you a snapshot here of essentially some specifically uh, Berkshire railroads then and now. If you look at railroads at their peak at the left, um, you'll see how we had that connecting line between North Adams and, and Pittsfield. That's now the Ashewiltecook Rail Trail. Uh, all that's left is about five miles. We were successful in restoring uh, one more mile of that to bring us up to five. I'll tell you that story towards the end of my, my presentation. Uh, and of course, we operated as a museum on the Berkshire Line heading south from Pittsfield, Lenox, West Stockbridge, Stockbridge, excuse me, Stockbridge, Lee, and down. Uh, the right um, figure here just kind of shows you what's left. You can see that as the years have gone on, the railroad infrastructure has most certainly um, dried up, and there's a lot less of it. 
So in addition to the stories, the equipment, et cetera, we were, we were proud with our Adams project to actually preserve one mile of a physical railroad. Okay, Laura. Stockbridge Station, our newest acquisition, built 1893. Uh, that was funded by the Laurel Hill Association. It's a Frank Waller designed building in the English Gothic Revival. Uh, and it was destroyed, almost nearly destroyed by a kitchen fire in 1965 when it was a, was a nightclub. Uh, we were lessees to this building for quite some time. You can advance, Laura. And uh, thankfully, uh, we were good stewards of it, and the Fitzpatrick organization uh, that had owned it for a period of time through their High Meadow Foundation was very generous in donating to us a portion of that, that property. Um, and we were also very lucky to have a gentleman who donated uh, the balance of the purchase price to us. So we were able to acquire this very historic piece of property. Upper pictures, you'll see it uh, during the heyday. The bottom middle picture is its uh, recent configuration down below. The right-hand side was a very early Berkshire Scenic train in the late 1980s. You'll see how the, the track uh, condition was quite deteriorated at that time. And on the far left-hand side, you'll see that uh, very famous nose of that FL9 locomotive at Stockbridge. And you'll see above it that there are two uh, pencil drawings up there. Uh, we have historic drawings of our stations that we've chartered to have done, uh, and we sell those for fundraising purposes uh, for folks. Go ahead, Laura. So Stockbridge Station today, the last passenger train stopped about 1960. Um, the station was purchased by the Fitzpatrick Organization in 1997, and Berkshire Scenic was a lessee of the property from 2002 to 2011, using it as a southern terminus for our train rides. High Metal sold the station to us in, in 2019. They partially donated at fair market value. We received a substantial donation to cover that purchase price. We had a tenant in there for a, a bit of time because we're not operating our tourist trains at this time, so we had a tenant in there. Um, they're moving out due to um, the economic downturn, so now we're seeking another tenant to put in there to heat, uh, help us with those funds so we can preserve the building further. Um, and eventually our goal is to restore the historic tourist train service between Lenox and Stockbridge. You can see on that upper right-hand picture how much better the tracks looked after the tracks were rehabilitated in 2003 for Berkshire Scenic Passenger Operation. Okay, Laura. Our uh, oldest station that we've had in our collection is Lenox Station, constructed in 1902. The original 1850 station burnt down. Um, it was built at a, cons at a cost of about $13,000. This is a unique station, as was Stockbridge. It was, they were not built to standard New Haven Railroad architectural design. Stockbridge and Lenox had unique populations, and therefore the New Haven wanted special stations built uh, that reflected the clientele that used the station. So we're very lucky that they still stand, and Berkshire Scenic is very lucky to be the uh, caretakers and custodians of them. In 1986, the building was donated to the museum uh, by a local construction firm, and it was fully restored uh, by about 1995, give or take, using a variety of different funds and it was listed, uh, restored back to its original appearance and listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Go ahead, Laura. The upper right-hand photograph is our master plan. That is not what our Lenox property looks like now. In fact, there's a, a quite ugly industrial building in that, that far right-hand corner. That's our restoration shop. We were able to purchase that. Our goal is to eventually demolish it, build a historic-looking uh, historic restoration shop, and that return that entire looking vista back to the way it did at the turn of the 20th century. So you can see the great difference there in that bottom left-hand picture. You can see where you actually have to step down now into the Port Cocher. Uh, our goal is to clear all of that out, return grade, uh, and really make it a nice public space in addition to the museum space to visit October Mountain. Okay, Laura. So uh, the last project I'm going to talk about uh, today and is the one that's been the most uh, exhausting and challenging for us is essentially building a new railroad. In 2012, Berkshire Scenic lost our operating rights on the Berkshire line. Uh, we knew we needed uh, to operate historic trains. It's in our charter. It's our mission. It's what we do best. Uh, we are not a purely static museum. We worked with the City of North Adams, Town of Adams, and Mass DOT in our legislative delegation and we began to look at uh, where else could we operate trains, knowing that the likelihood of us being able to operate out of Linux, uh, that door had closed at that time. I'm proud of these pictures on the left because they actually show the end of the line here in Adams looking south 
the bottom left where you see all the grass. Uh, that's what it looked like. That was earmarked to be a portion of the, the rail trail. We built a coalition uh, for support. We built a shared use bike trail corridor and railroad corridor. And those two pictures at the top show the staged work uh, where you can see the end of that crossing panel was then ballasted, graveled, brush cut, cleared, ties were laid down, and then you can see the bottom right hand photograph where the contractor was dumping ballast on a section of track that was never meant to be restored back. Okay, Laura? So the Hoosick Valley train ride experience, we conceived that in 2012. Uh, we looked at Hoyoke Heritage State Park going between downtown Hoyoke and the Ingleside Mall. We also looked at operating over on the Grafton and Upton near Worcester. And we also looked at somewhere between, say, Holyoke, Northampton and Greenfield on the Connecticut River Line. Uh, all of those had difficulties. All of those had uh, problems for us in terms of our charter being here in the Berkshires. But MassDOT was a substantial partner to this, and we chose the Adams Branch for our uh, expanded operations. The project consisted of rehabilitating four miles of lightly used freight track, building one new mile of track, redesigning the rail trail and creating a shared use corridor and building all new passenger amenities. MassDOT purchased the rail line and funded a four mile refurbishment. The Town of Adams and City of North Adams earned a joint MassWorks grant to build the new track, all the passenger platforms and station buildings. The North Adams end of the line still requires the station complex to be built. We've had some uh, concepts to try to replicate on a much smaller scale what North Adams Union Station looked like. We lost North Adams Union Station uh, to the urban renewal era of the 1960s. Go ahead, Laura. So how do we build a new railroad? How do we build those new uh, infrastructure projects? You'll see there, once again, there's the new track. You'll see that's the shared use corridor right there, along with the Hoosick uh, River flood control system in the foreground. Uh, and you'll see the red, we call that the red roof platform. For those of you who had Lionel trains as a kid or familiar, uh, Donna Season and our architectural team here at Design Hub to kind of replicate uh, a Lionel train station platform. On the left is uh, just a map of quickly of where we serve from North Adams where our end of line is and all the way down to our boarding location here in, in Adams. Our logo, Hoosick Valley Berkshire, that just is, um, we tried to market uh, a separate location other than Linux and that replicates the original New York Central ownership of the Adams Branch Railroad. Go ahead, Laura. On your left, uh, you'll see the completed Adams Station um, grounds. I'll talk about Adams Station in the next slide. And you can see the shared use corridor and the beautiful vista that we have of the Hoosick Valley uh, from uh, the train. Upper right hand photograph shows an authentic uh, grain and coal facility. That is a typical quintessential New England uh, freight railroad branch line. Thankfully, the town of Adams purchased that property prior to my arrival as town administrator. And our goal is to convert that parcel, restore the building, and convert the parcel to a dog park, but also do something with the building uh, to interpret what its history was as a typical New England branch line uh, business. Uh, this photograph was just a, a couple years ago. You'll see the new ballast, the new track there, and again, demonstrating the shared use corridor. And the bottom is just a nice picture of, of the train going along the Hoosick River. Next slide, please, Laura. Uh, again, Berkshires is very lucky to have, not unlike Palmer, um, uh, Holyoke, and a few other of our Western Mass communities that still have our original train stations. The upper left is Renfrew Station. That was a location here in the town of Adams. It's privately owned. Uh, we've attempted to acquire the property and acquire the building. It's just unfortunately well beyond Berkshire Scenic's fiscal capabilities. The right-hand side just shows how the town of Adams was able to design the new infrastructure as an acknowledgement of the old. The top black and white photo is the still existing original Adams downtown train station. That is now AJ's Trailside Pub. The foreground where you see the tracks is now the rail trail. When the town was designing the new facility, that building on the bottom there, the yellow one with the red roof, that was originally a three-bay car wash. You'll see how the architects in the town wanted to invoke the original style of the original station. So although it may not be an authentic railroad building, it certainly evokes that spirit and architectural uh, design uh, of a railroad building. Go ahead, Laura. So that concludes our project. There's probably a lot more uh, questions that I can answer, um, but I can be reached at that email address. Please check out our Facebook page and our, our webpage. 
Uh, and I'd love to bring anybody around any of the, the uh, projects that we have and, and talk more. If you'd like to come out for a visit, uh, we'd love to show you around. And I, I really, Laura, appreciate the time and, and everyone's attention. And uh, thank you for everything that you do for historic preservation. Jay, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, I would just encourage everyone to type questions into the chat. Um, Beth will be helping to moderate questions for presenters um, after we're done with all presentations. So I'm going to briefly stop sharing and get back to um, my files so that I can share with you the next presentation. And that will be um, Blake Lamoth of Union Station in Palmer. Hi, how are you today? Can you hear me? Can you hear I me? can. I'm oh. going to just make sure that I can share my screen as well. Um, sorry for the delay here. I know, but I could click right through and click. Okay. Okay, then. So so, Laura, will you be doing the uh, button push into? Uh, I'll be happy to, sure. Okay. Oh, I mean, I could do it as well, I guess. It doesn't really matter. What do we got, about 10 minutes or so? To... Yes. Okay. All right. All right. It should be sharing out to everybody, the Palmer, Palmer Union Station. Is everybody seeing that? Okay. All right. Go ahead, Blake. All right, so uh, we purchased this station in uh, 1987. Uh, I was 25 years old. It was the first property that I bought in Palmer. And uh, it's been quite an undertaking. And uh, since then, we've done a, a lot of different repairs to the building. And if you want to uh, go ahead, go ahead, Laura, and hit the next slide. Um, we've acquired pictures over the years. Uh, the bottom picture is the Olmstead Park. This was a postcard. Uh, that was that was taken right upon completion of the park. Uh, we do have others as well. And up above, you're seeing a uh, about 1924 or so, 1926, the long canopy uh, along the east-west uh, side of the building. Go ahead, Laura. Uh, Henry Hobson Richardson uh, designed the station. Uh, there were 11 of them built along the Boston and Albany at that time. And Palmer's station uh, basically is probably one of the best that represents still the Victorian era uh, in a collaboration with Olmsted was done at this location as well. Go ahead. Uh, unfortunately, around the 1890s, though, there was a fire that took place here. Um, we were able to acquire these pictures from uh, other people in the town. And the uh, building to the, uh, the, the picture to the left shows there was an outbuilding and that had been removed after the fire. It kind of uh, took away from the visual impact of the building as well. Go ahead. Uh, to the left again on this picture, you're gonna see a photograph or a postcard that was uh, probably sold at the station. And then the interior, uh, as we purchased it in 87, without the ticket office. Uh, the ticket office uh, was removed. We were able to save some parts and incorporate it into the uh, vestibule uh, as we rebuilt the station. And the doors on the right-hand side were down in the bottom of the station. Pieces were missing. And I had the uh, up above uh, windows rebuilt and duplicated as the same to create the entrance, the vestibule. Go ahead. Uh, you're looking as basically when I bought the building, uh, they cut the canopy off. I fought for rights, title, and interest and sued the railroad uh, and got the rights to rebuild the canopy because in the deed, we had all the rights to the canopy as it existed uh, when, the per when the purchase was made uh, originally in 1964 by Bruno Tassinari. So it was sort of a little court battle, but I, the, the canopy is essential to the building. Uh, the water break at that line is very close to the building. And we would like to seek funds if we could, or through this east-west connection, uh, tie Palmer back in uh, east-west, north and south as well. Uh, the, the building, we've done a lot of work to that. That, that picture that you see there to the left, um, all the roofs have been repaired up there in the valleys, and, but there is no canopy attached back to the uh, east-west side. 
The front of the building basically was there when we uh, purchased it. Uh, I brought some stuff in there. That, that picture there may be a year old. And uh, we did everything under our power to try to uh, pay the mortgage and, and, and repair the building as well. Uh, go ahead. Uh, this is our flea market days, uh, probably around the late uh, 80s, early 90s. Uh, we were, as you can see, the building on the inside was rough. Uh, it was painted. Uh, there was a lot of water infiltration at that time. Uh, sometimes when it rained outside, it seemed like it was raining more inside uh, in different locations. So it was it had been quite an undertaking. Of course, we've, we've uh, way beyond that now, but uh, there was a lot of work that had to be done to this building to bring it back to shape. Go ahead. So uh, I decided uh, that we needed to do some work here. Uh, of course, I knew that when I bought the building, but I took on quite an undertaking. I rebuilt the whole canopy on the north-south uh, side along the central Vermont side. Um, and that project uh, was slate, uh, roof repair, beam work, and uh, up above beams, upright posts, and uh, uh, the brackets on the side, as you can see. And if you look at the right-hand picture, you'll see some skylight openings that were up in the roof there at one time. There's a vaulted ceiling on the inside of the station. Uh, eventually, we would like to put the skylights back in the building. We believe in World War II, uh, those skylights were removed uh, and the uh, station was blacked out, uh, so it could not be seen at night. That's, that's what we have heard over the time. So go ahead. Uh, again, this is the exterior of the building. After some renovations, uh, the staging uh, was up uh, along this building for many years. The valleys have been rebuilt. The up above dormers have been rebuilt. Every window in the building has been taken out, repaired, reglazed, stripped, and repainted. Uh, but of course, you see in the east-west side there in the platform, uh, as you look at the platform, you'll see the uh, uprights uh, to support a new canopy has also been installed. And a lot of the concrete has been repaired along that side. And right to the edge of that picture is the, uh, is the main line, which is not in that picture, but it's right there. The, the building is very close to the tracks. All right, go ahead. Uh, we brought in a Porter locomotive. I believe it or not, we bought it at a flea market, a uh, Hubbardston flea market. Uh, we, we brought that in so people could uh, come down. And the, Palmer is known as the town of seven railroads. As you can see on the map, there are a lot of connections in Palmer at one time, uh, as, as well as the Berkshires. But uh, we took this locomotive to bring it down to promote our, our restaurant uh, venue and also to promote the town of seven railroads uh this this locomotive originally was in virginia it also was out in uh, the agawam for a while in feeding hills and then it went out to hubbardston and now it's 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 its main places in uh, parma here today so those pictures represent when we were moving the locomotive in go ahead uh, this is the station as it is today. Um, uh, well, I, I should say not is today. That's July 2004. But the steaming tender arose out of all this work and construction. Um, we we really wanted to. We put took us 17 years to restore the building because we put all our own money into it. We sacrificed a lot of stuff to, in order for this to happen. Um, the building is, uh, I've repointed all the upper dormers and a lot of the lower parts of the building. The chimneys have been rebuilt and it's all had the raised bead to match the type of in, uh, cement work that was done there. Uh, we, we wanted to match everything. Like the company I have is Real Estate Restorations and this was one of the first things I bought and, and, and took under to restore, uh, which, which was a major undertaking because a lot of work had been neglected uh, probably for 60 years on this building or so, uh, as far as uh, masonry work, roof work. Uh, everything was fixed with a can of tar uh, when I basically purchased this building. So go ahead. 
Uh, this represents the Romanesque architecture in the building. Uh, it shows the arches, um, the, the doorways. Uh, there was only one door that was left on the building when I purchased it, and we put the doors back in the archways. Uh, we, we duplicated three doors, and the hinges that you see there were uh, something that Richardson used quite a bit in his architecture, and uh, the owner wanted the hinges, but I wouldn't give them back to him uh, uh, along with the sale because I knew someday I was going to restore those doors and I needed the hinges. Okay, go ahead. Um, from left to right, this is under the canopy. Of course, you can see this is COVID times. We've all been in it and uh, we're still in it a little bit here. And the girls have got their overalls on. We try to keep this railroad themed and uh, we've managed to do that. We, we brought in an Osgood Bradley car you can see behind them. Uh, and uh, that came from the Grafton Upton Railroad from the New Haven Technical Society. The center picture duplicates our nighttime dining that we have out there now. And then the, the right uh, side represents the, uh, the north south side represents all the cobblestones that we put in uh, under that canopy. We cobblestone almost about 200 feet uh, under the north south side as well. Go ahead. Okay, so this represents the interior. What you're seeing right now was gone. I duplicated all that work. Uh, the uh, bathroom walls and the smoking area were gone. Uh, I bought the shoe shine booths at Brimfield. I happened to notice the same colors that the station was painted when I was leaving Brimfield and we picked up that shoe shine booth and restored that as well and put it back in the foyer. And the picture to the right uh, was all gone. I, I put those walls back up in the ticket office in there, um, which was missing. The, the ticket office that you see in there uh, came out of the Barry Savings Bank, and it's, it was uh, about the same time uh, when the station was built. So the error of the motif of that was basically the same. And the outline of the wall is in the exact location where it originally was. Um, along with the uh, men's smoking room as well. Uh, we have, we put in the bathrooms in the front area. Go ahead. Uh, this is the interior of the building. Uh, shows the uh, Romanesque architecture to the uh, uh, roof lines. And it also shows you all the windows in, in the up above areas that uh, brought light in. You're not seeing the whole total ceiling in this picture. But it gives you an idea of the openness of the building and uh, how, uh, how the, it, it attracted a lot of people and you could put a lot of people in this building to go north, south, east, or west. Go ahead. Uh, this represents our interior again, the uh, brick arches uh, to the uh, left and some of the work we've done. This is the, the picture you're seeing is on the uh, New London side. And then the bar that we installed is, is under that archway as well. And uh, that's used for the restaurant today. And the motif inside the building, we've got it as the conductor's lounge. Go ahead. Uh, this is the Osgood Bradley car we brought in uh, from the Grafton Upton line. And uh, we brought that in, I think around 2007 or so. Uh, you can see the steam engine in the background. Uh, again, this is to, pr to promote uh, Palmer and to promote the uh, a dining experience uh, at the railroad station. And we did quite a bit of work to that car as well uh, to bring that back to its uh, originality on the inside. Go ahead. Um, this shows the recent activities to the left. We've had some people down there. Uh, uh, singing and doing things uh, to promote during the COVID, the outside dining under the canopy, and then we decorate the car. Uh, the inside of the unit also to the right, you'll see us when we were restoring and painting the car. Of course, with all these cars and everything, it's, there's a lot of maintenance, and anybody in the railroad industry knows that to keep up with stuff. You, it's a constant demand to, you know, the maintenance side of it is very important, and the preservation of it all is, it's a lot of work, so you need help and we've uh, 
we don't have any volunteers. We pay everybody to do everything, but uh, we, we, we spend a lot of time and we're trying to promote uh, this, this line as well. Go ahead, Laura. Um, this is Frederick Law Olmsted, the park that was designed there. We uh, purchased this park from the railroad, Rail America, during a uh, acquisition of sale that they were under. Uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, I know the guys on the railroad. Uh, they saw our need for the restoration and uh, we unearthed this park as well. Uh, this is a very valuable asset to the town of Palmer. Uh, I was after the town for years to do something and they never pursued this avenue. So we ended up purchasing it ourselves and we've uh, pictures to come. Go ahead, Laura, we'll get to the next pictures here. Uh, there's my family on the left, of course, uh, my daughters, Scarlett and Linnea, and my wife, Robin, and I. You see the arch uh, behind us. This whole park was buried uh, on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, you'll see basically the top of the arch, and uh, there was about uh, two or three feet of dirt that uh, represented the, the work that had to go on place on top of the arch. And then another 20 feet down to the bottom of the grotto, basically, uh, is what we had to remove out of there for gravel. We'll go ahead. Uh, so now you're taking a look at as we're, we've got down to the uh, arch of the grotto. Uh, Bob Manzi worked with me, and that's a picture of me uh, taking a break, having a coffee there. And then we started the granite work. Uh, as you can see in the right hand picture, uh, to represent the park, but we had to push it back a little bit, but keep the dimensions and the grades the same. We, I, I unearthed a set of drawings at the, uh, on the Olmstead uh, National Historical Site of the Olmstead Papers and the Olmstead uh, on 99 Warren Street in Boston, and this was under job number 647. Uh, this project, uh, along with others, was part of the Boston and Albany uh, renovation projects uh, around 1884. So this, this was a big undertaking. Go ahead, Laura. Uh, now you see what we brought back, the top of the grotto, the granite, the curbing, and you see to the left, you'll see a, a brick sidewalk coming down. Well, in order to with the constraints of cars, trucks, and everything else, we brought the park back and we made it so we can park longer vehicles up towards the brick sidewalk. And then we brought the, the granite all around the park as well. And one of, in the other picture to the left, you'll see all the brick we had piled up there uh, to the left before the brick sidewalk went in we still have got to get the uh, pond in there. That, that had a pond and a fountain in it. I actually found the fountain, old rusted piece of metal down there, and there was a well on the bottom of that as well. Go ahead. Uh, here's another little undertaking we took on, the, uh, uh, which was uh, an older building right near the railroad station. It actually served as a livery for the uh, for the railroad station. Uh, there were three barns in the back of this building and we turned this into an inn, uh, which is now the train master's inn. Go ahead. Well, this building we restored, we put a wraparound porch around it. We do overnight accommodations here. Uh, we kept the motif of the brick walkways uh, in this and we also laid some track in the back of the building to give it a railroad theme. And you can see along the brick uh, sidewalks, we put some rail in as well. Rail is very nice to hold brick in, to be honest with you, it works very well. Go ahead. All right, so uh, we purchased this caboose uh, just recently. Uh, we're gonna use this for overnight accommodations. Um, I got it down on, in Connecticut and we moved it up here. Uh, it just came in and we now recently placed it on some railroad tracks. Uh, the Naugatuck Railroad uh, uh, had it down there. We purchased from a 
from a person uh, separately and had had it stored there. And uh, Howard Pincus was very, very uh, helpful uh, with this project for me. I got to commend him. And uh, he's a very nice guy and he's very railroad orientated uh, and he's a wonderful person to work with. Uh, this caboose will serve, uh, will sleep four and will be ready in uh, uh, 2021 for uh, overnight accommodations. Go ahead. Uh, that shows the station, uh, the outline and the unique setup of this building. It's a trapezoid between the tracks and uh, you can see the locomotive, the steam locomotive and the, and the passenger car there that we placed and the railroad tracks uh, that tie into this uh, location. And at the back of the building is a walkway uh, that we are trying to actively get opened up through the town where people used to access the station as well from the top of the street, street and as well from under the bridge. Uh, and it's another project that we need to get moving on, of course. Go ahead. All right. So we recently have purchased a building. Uh, it's not four, four tenths of a mile. It's about eight, 800 feet uh, from this area, which will serve at the New London side uh, of the tracks. And it, it could accommodate up to over 200 cars without a problem. And it would allow connection to the north, south, east, and west. Uh, that's in the works right now. And we're also, we've got that land, thanks to the planning board working with the town of Palmer, uh, that we can do excursion trains on this site as well. And we acquired about 660 feet uh, with this property of a spur uh, a siding which will allow us to at least put four, four passenger cars in there. And this, we finally just closed on this about a month ago, a little over a month ago. It took about 13 months to close this deal. So uh, when you're looking at four, it's not a half a mile uh, to the, to the uh, station. It's much less than that. Um, we're, we're talking maybe about eight to 1200 feet maximum. It's a typo. So we, we're gonna fix that and resend that to you eventually. Yeah. Okay, Laura, go ahead. Uh, these are renderings from Architectural Insights here in Parma. Uh, the staging is no longer there, it's down. Um, you can see that the building uh, from the previous pictures uh, when I bought it uh, um, are, uh, has changed quite a bit. But the visual impact of the building needs the canopies and also the protection from water infiltration. The building is on the National Register of Historical Places um, we had the rights to rebuild the canopy there. We were, we worked with a James Gray years ago through the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. There, there was a grant that was allocated to this building before the big dig came. And uh, it was probably around 1992, uh, the big dig came, uh, the ICT funding left, uh, and uh, we never received any funding since then. Uh, to restore any of this building. Um, we, the future for that was very bright at the time. There were five Amtrak trains running in and out of Parma every day. Um, now we're down to just the Lakeshore Limited. But we do believe one of the first things that should be done here is the Lakeshore Limited should be accessed uh, right away. And whether we do a low level platform or high level platforms could be built towards the bridge. As you look towards the bridge, there's a capability of doing a high level platforms there as well. So uh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So I appreciate everybody taking a look at our project here today. Uh, we're still underway. Um, we were very much interested in moving ahead with passenger service at this location. Uh, there's been write-ups on this building historically wise. I'm glad to see that there's people here that are, are members of the uh, uh, are very concerned about the, the, the archives of the building and, and preserve preservation side of this. Uh, this property was on the endangered list uh, many, many years ago, one of 11 most endangered properties in Massachusetts. 
Uh, we've put our life's work into this to save this building, and we still have a little ways to go on this, of course. Uh, but my main concern is the right-hand side of the building, uh, the canopy, and at least getting that canopy up on that side of the building to preserve that side of the building. We have some deterioration going along there now with the doors uh, because of the water infiltration there. Uh, and we really, we really need to get some, get some work done there. So we're hoping when this east-west connection happens in Primer, we were able to supply a parking lot. We're also able, hopefully, to get some funds to put into the canopy restoration of this building. Uh, you know, these stations were kind of temples to the area. And uh, this being one of the last examples, one of the many last examples of the Victorian era uh, stations, uh, you know, Worcester Station was, I think, replaced in 1920. And it was, a, before that you had, it was on Franklin Street and you had that stone structure there that kind of was a resemblance of what uh, Palmer was. Uh, Palmer was, you know, the town of seven railroads and we're hoping in the future uh, that we can develop some rail excursion trains off of this site that we've acquired. And also uh, in order to make this happen for the east-west connection, we're, we're able to offer some uh, parking area right now to, to, to uh, kick this off. So I thank you for taking the time today and listening. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to move right into our third presentation. And just a reminder that if you have questions, please put them into the chat so that we can um, tackle those at the end. I am going to again share my screen and open up the presentation from Chris at Tandem Bagel Company. Hi, everybody. Blake, that was impressive. Um, I'd want to say that we're coming at this um, approach a lot different. I'm not a historian by any means. And uh, over the last 10 years, we've um, put some time and effort into restoring, you know, an old train station in East Hampton, Mass, um, and turned it into a cafe, a bagel cafe. So I don't have as much history, and, and don't quote me on some of the dates. I'm picking it up more recent and some history from um, the property owner and some files I've been finding. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's newer, and we've done um, a restoration on improving the building that was not really being used um, at all and had no, nothing put into it in probably about 30 or 40 years. So again, this is um, part of the New Haven, New York, Northampton rail line that uh, we're located on Railroad Street in East Hampton, Mass. Um, it's a building, I guess you can go on, Laura. From what I gather, I found paperwork from the 19th. Uh -oh. But from, from some uh, articles, I found these like East Hampton, um, Factories uh, going in the, in the early 1900s, so I had a lot of connect, a lot of um, people coming to town. Wollaston, Northampton, let me see here, purchased a building, and I think it's, I can't see it on my screen. For like the 1960s, 19, late 1950s, um, they only bought it because it was adjacent to the property, um, and they were basically using it as a maintenance facility um, and storage. You know, so it wasn't being used for anything. Um, the, the rail line was still being operated until the 60s or the um until the 80s actually um but there was no passenger service in the around the 1970s wilston actually took the building and converted it to an art studio um so for about 20 years there was art classes and it was being used as a classroom um in the late 90s an art director actually was living in the space so they converted it to kind of a, a art studio slash a residential apartment and the art director was there until um around 2011 2012 when she decided to retire um, and we approached the school about you taking the space, kind of redoing it and opening up as a, as a restaurant. Right, Laura? So from history, what I found is um, I found some pictures and some, when we were doing the restorations, we actually found uh, not a lot, but a good number of documents up in the attics that were um, from the 20s and 30s. Looks like it was a lot of the billing, a lot of the, um, luggage tracking. We found a lot of luggage tags like these here um, and documents that were tracking the amount of fares and the transportation and the people that were traveling from here to mainly local. It seemed like from here to Northampton a lot, East Hampton and Northampton. Okay, Laura. In the 1950s, um, 
here's a picture of the 1950s. This is kind of when the, you can see the building was going downhill. Um, the extended uh, roof over the sides was cut short already. Um, and the passenger service ended in the late 1950s. So you can see some of the, here's like one of the documents. Most of them are in pretty rough shape. Um, they were basically stuffed into the insulation in the attic. Um, but we have a number of documents that we haven't really done anything with. And if there's anybody with interest in the rail line stuff, we could definitely share some of that stuff. Um, go on. Here is roughly in the 19, a picture from the 70s. Williston actually acquired a caboose that they put on the property. They were hoping to do something with it as an art studio and it never actually panned out. Um, and you can see from the, the pictures in the 1970s, they started using it as an art studio and an art classroom. They ended up having a, a kiln in the courtyard outside, um, spinning wheels, and, and was doing a bunch of um, ceramic making and art making in the building. All right. In around 2003, um, the rail at the East Hampton line was actually lifted up and the 2006 uh, mile Manhan Rail Trail opened. So the train line has been taken out. Um, you can see in a picture um, where on the left side of the building is the, or right on the trail, on the line. So now we're actually on a bike trail, the uh, Manhan Rail Trail. All right. In 2012, uh, myself and another family, my wife and another family decided to jump in and, and try to re rehab the building. And again, we weren't looking at it as, as historical restoration, but actually trying to just make it um, usable. There was um, no money or nothing put into the building probably since the 50s, since it closed. So we pretty much took it down to the shell. There was um, no insulation, no roofs, uh, no ceilings inside the building. Um, we had to redo a lot of the wiring, a lot of the plumbing um, in, in order to take it from a, a art studio slash apartment to a, a restaurant. Okay. So as you can see most of the building uh, covered the uh, platform. Um, they enclosed the platform area. So that had been there from the 50s or 60s, I'm not sure when. Um, we financed the building and the, the build out and the reconstruction. Williston, the owner of the building, it's a private school in East Hampton, Mass. Um, that's were kind of on the edge of their campus. They actually provided us some rental abatements for the, all the money we put into the building. The local city and government were all supportive. Uh, basically, we did about 90% of electrical plumbing updates. Um, we did a number of new windows. We added insulation where there wasn't anything. Um, and we converted the space from a restaurant, residential to a restaurant bakery. Okay. So here's some, uh, again, some pictures from where it was probably in the 80s when it was more of an art studio. You can see it was, it was kind of rough um, to where it is in the current state. We've um, rebuilt the walls, rebuilt the, uh, the windows. Um, kept most of the exterior of the building intact from the way it was when we took it over. So nothing has changed really on the outside. Okay. And again, some more pictures of the, the main fireplace uh, of where it was in the 80s, where it probably was in the 20s and where it is today. We've kind of kept it all alone. The inside of the walls were all painted when we got them. So we have um, just updated all that. Okay. So in recapping it, again, I don't have a, a lot of information on this, but the project was, you know, we, we were slightly over budget. It took a little longer. We're not um, rest restoring it like Blake did, where we were um, basically bringing it up to a, a good space. It took about seven months. We started in September of 2012, and um, we finished it about March of 2013. The bike trail was, for us, being a restaurant cafe on the grounds is a added success, and it launched our business, and this was our first go at opening a restaurant in the Pioneer Valley. Um, and it seemed to it helped us with this, with a unique character of the building um, into further growth. Okay. And again, here's a picture of the outside of the way it is today. Um, it was our first, we, we actually called it, it was a bakery. We actually baked our bagels and everything there. The station was unique, had great character. Um, we feel like we did help the East Hampton Mass has had a good revitalization in the last 10, 12 years, 15 years. We feel like we were part of that, bringing a lot more people into the downtown area. Um, we opened another location in 14, we purchased another bakery in 16, and we just consolidated bakeries and opened a, a third location in Hadley. So the railroad station, and the, uh, the train station that we started with was a great asset to us. Um, and starting our business, um, we hope we, 
fixed it up to where it's a, a much better place than it was um, 20 years ago. And uh, that's about all I got. So again, it's not a full in-depth historical perspective on it. It's kind of where we were with it and for about the last eight years. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay. Um, I am going to turn it over to Beth to see if we have any questions that came her way um, during the course of presentations. Um, and of course, if you have uh, questions that you're thinking of now, you can either type them into the chat or it looks like we have a small enough group that it would be fine to unmute yourself and simply raise your hand. <laughs> um, so, so I did, there was one question in the chat. It was for Blake. Um, and the question was, are the overnight accommodations in the caboose year round? They will be year round. Um, I'm subbing in. He had a meeting to head into. I'm his wife, Robin. Um, yes, we have set it up with um, AC and heat and it has running water. Great. And I, I actually, I actually had another question that um, actually it could each of the presenters could maybe just talk about how they've included s historical information about the buildings, like if they've included any historical information within like in the restaurant, you know, on the back of the menu or um, in some location, like how have they been able to um, kind of present the, the, the history of the site previously into the business that they're running now. And maybe start, we'll start with Chris because he went last yeah. and then <laughs> kind of Yeah, goes. mine was pretty short. Um, we actually, like I said, we got some documents, we've got some information and some history and Williston has some information for us. Um, but again, because we just opened the business and um, it took off and it was very busy, we haven't had a lot of time to actually go back and do that. We always had plans to do it. We just haven't gotten there yet, but that is in, it's in our notes to do something with some of the products that we found and some of the stuff that the school has given us. Great. Robin, yes. Um, basically, um, we are always consistently looking to purchase items from the local area. Um, but um, prior to COVID, um, our menus always included the history and we've usually updated because we're, we're constantly changing and, you know, adding new features and whatnot to whatever we're doing with the park, the caboose, the, the inn. But it, for us, it's essential that um, we put a human component on it, that all of our servers are well versed on all of uh, the history. And if they don't know an answer, they are actually diverted to myself. Myself and my daughter are on site all the time. Um, you know, when people come to dine at our restaurant, they're coming in not just for the food, but they're looking they're looking for, they're coming to a destination and they wanna know everything there is to know about it. Um, so that's, we try to give that, um, you know, that short term connection with our, our guests to make them feel that they are a guest, not just someone walking through the door. So um, that interpersonal um, chat is very important. Okay, and I don't, I don't know if Jay is still on or if he did not has any. I'm here. Okay. Did you have, I know you talked a lot about that. Did you have anything just a quick um, about how, you know, maybe, maybe like the one of like the most important ways that you've like kind of gotten the history out. I know you, you guys seem to do a lot of events and um, just the whole <laughs> train ride is all about kind of li reliving the history, but. It, it is the stations themselves are the historic e exhibits and, and, uh, when you go to Linux Museum, uh, your, the station is the exhibit, and we have all of the building history, its restoration information, historic photographs on display. Uh, Stockbridge Station, uh, don't, we don't have a lot of exhibits in that because it's been a commercial use property. However, Adams Station, which was not a historic property, we've had to figure out how do we tell that story, and that has been uh, with a onboard vocal narration and then we have plans as we finish the interior of the building using a mass cultural facilities grant fund um, we have about eighty thousand dollars forty in matching forty from the the cultural facilities fund part of that money is earmarked for historical exhibits uh, that even though you're not in a historic building per se uh, there will be exhibits that talk about the function of a railroad station and its relevance to a branch line in adams 
Great, thank you. Um, there's a cup, there's some other questions. So um, another question, how has the general public supported your efforts to restore history in your communities? Um, and again, we can just take a minute to kind of go through and um, I'm just looking on my screen and Chris, you're the fir <laughs> first one I see. So I'll just <laughs> start with you. Yeah, I mean, the general, again, for us, it's, we're fairly new and the general public has been um, hugely helpful in us um, doing what we've done at the space. Great. So. Um, and the pa Palmer? Um, well, basically, you know, our, what we've done, we've kickstarted, um, you know, the whole rejuvenation of the whole rail um, and refurbishing a lot of the old buildings. And so as you're going to see a major change on um, our side of Main Street, a lot of people are reinvesting and keeping the, um, the town of the seven railroads, keeping the um, look of the buildings, keeping it old world. And, uh, you know, we're just pleased that our vacant buildings on Main Street are starting to fill. Great. Um, and, and Jay? So Lenox and Stockbridge have, and Lee Lenox Stockbridge have always been supportive because we've been around since 1984. Uh, Adams and North Adams was the new venue for us. And I can tell you that we couldn't have been done it without that coalition of Mass DOT for the railroad operation itself, but also for the, the two communities in, in terms of, of support. And the uniqueness about Berkshire Scenic, although we're a historical preservation or organization with a museum, you can see in Adams uh, the economic development impact that the, the uh, having a tourist railroad in your downtown area with beautiful facilities, having that historic anchor uh, can, can generate. So without that support, we haven't been able to do it. It's been overwhelming. It takes a lot of community outreach to explain it uh, and what it takes. But uh, once that train rolls or those people show up and, and cars pull over and they take a picture of that facility, uh, they realize what that railroad history can, can bring back for a community in, a, in modern, whether it's commercial space, uh, of a restaurant, uh, shops, uh, or whether it's a museum operation like ours. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question, it says probably mostly um, for Blake, although Robin is here <laughs> instead. Um, did you struggle with any building code constraints in your rehabilitation? Um, we really d did not. Um, we kind of, you know, it was your typical electrical plumbing. It was more structural. Um, we did not get any um, grant funding, which, you know, there are probably guidelines, but we are a prop for profit, so we are a nonprofit. So, um, but at, in our heart, we did what we thought was best for the building. Um, you know, we kept it as you, if you were walking into a real into a museum, a living museum, basically. Great. And other others did um, the other presenters, anyone, um, maybe Chris, particularly, because you're you were kind of moving towards a re you know restaurant space that wasn't like a traditionally what the little train station had had. Um, um, we didn't have any. I mean, we had to upgrade everything to the proper building codes, but we didn't have any um, any issues with them. We were able to meet all the codes without any extra zoning, extra changes, or any um, appeals. Great. And and Jay, anything? Not on the his, Not for the historic uh, pieces. We've been very lucky being able to work with those local jurisdictions with any restoration work we have to do. Stockbridge will eventually require substantial, Linux will require some substantial rehab on the, on the canopy work. Up here in Adams, because it's all new construction, including that platform that you saw, yes, we had to go through the, all of the, the usual process with that and meet all the ADA requirements, which of, of course jacks up the, the price astronomically. Uh, but we overcame that with making sure we had sufficient funding and we had a good relationship with the local officials. Great. Um, any advice to, uh, to others contemplating these types of projects? So for anybody, I guess, looking to take on a full train station, <laughs> rehabilitation, um, anybody have any advice that they would pass along? Well, I can take that one first. Um, there's a double-edged sword between looking at a property that needs to be preserved that no one else is doing anything with versus joining up with other organizations that are, are doing it. There's some, although it's regional based, 
uh, a lot of times we have seen, at least in the railroad preservation world, that it's bifurcated, it, it's splintered. Um, and an organization can't survive if, if everyone that, the fewer numbers that are interested in preservation activities, at least on the historic nonprofit side, uh, don't do. Uh, so that's one aspect coming from a 501c3. Uh, on the other side, I would say, at least from building new infrastructure uh, with a museum, uh, make sure you have good partnerships and the, the funding is, is just, the financing is critical, the building code issues can be problematic. Um, it's a, you're doing it for the love of doing it, not necessarily for the business aspect of it. Every, I think every as town administrator, I can tell you, you know, every opportunity I have here to speak with somebody interested in open a business, there's a combination of what's my return versus I'm doing this because I love the property. Um, I, I think at the end, a lot of these are, are frank, frankly projects of love, uh, not necessarily for a return. And Robin? Well, um, ours um, was basically um, for the love of the building and um, it did take us many years and lots of planning and things for us never happened overnight. So we had a, a lot of thought process of what our next module was going to be. And um, it's you know spurred off to antique shops, overnight accommodations, parks, parking, rail service. So everything that we are doing, um, we've done our proper research as to will it be, will it be profitable? Is, is there going to be money available at this point um, for us to go forward with whatever we're planning on doing? So, and you know, for our rail, you know, working, that's our really, our big next step is um, getting a, the rail stop in Palmer and getting ourselves uh, strategically placed where, you know, we are, Palmer is on the three studies, but you know, we definitely want the stop at the Palmer station or at least in the downtown district um, because it would definitely bring the economic development and help spur other businesses and uh, help our economy. And Chris, did you, do you have any advice for someone? I mean, I guess um, our, ours was a bit different. It wasn't, it was about a building that was there that um, wasn't really being utilized. And I think we looked at it as, as a potential, as a business, as a commercial space. Um, and then really did fell in love with the building as, as it being unique and as a good character fit for what we wanted to do. Um, I, I can't say we, we took it to the historical sense of, of trying to make it look like it was before. Um, other than a, to clean it up and make it uh, more usable and in a lot better condition for the, you know, for years to come. So I think uh, for people trying to get into it, again, there's two sides of it. Um, it is costly. So I will add that. <laughs> okay. And um, I see another question um, to all the present, all the presenters mentioned that their local governments have been supportive. Can you give an example of that support aside from any financial help and were the historic commissions a factor in any of these projects? Um, and I'll, I'll start with Chris this time. Yeah, we didn't have, um, we went to the his local historic society to see what we could find on the building itself and we didn't get a lot of information. Um, we, again, we didn't get any financial support. The governments were helpful in a, as far as uh, mainly the zoning changes and turning the building from a, a nonprofit school owned building to a for-profit taxable um, entity. Um, I would say that, you know, they, we didn't run into any roadblocks in any of the changes that we made to the building. Um, other than that, um, they've just been easy to work with. Great. And Robin? Um, you know, um, pretty much my husband and I had done everything ourselves. We really didn't have really much support from any organizations with the exception of getting it um, listed on the, um, the 10 most endangered 50 much, this is, I forget now, my husband would know more, but there was an endangered property list that we did get the station on. And now we are on the historical register, but we're, we haven't really been able to get any funding or whatnot due to the fact that we are uh, for profit. But, um, you know, for the town, um, you know, yes, you know, they support us, but, you know, we never really received any type of uh, endorsements or, you know, help you know, from the town. It's been pretty much, you know, our family just going forward and just, going forward, you know, never giving up. Great. And Jay? Lennox was incredibly helpful over the years through a community preservation grant. Uh, we had gotten to the point where we had obtained one to help demolish 
the industrial building that obscures the view of the historic station. Uh, and I think early on in the 80s, they were they were helpful with uh, supporting at, at least the grant applications, as well as endorsing what impact having a robust uh, historic train museum was in their community working with the legislative delegation. The most recent example I can give you, and the important one, really is North Adams and Adams. Uh, even though both communities, Adams did put in some financial assistance, but it was mostly in the grant writing and putting their weight as communities behind the opportunity to restore the excursion train rides to the county. That was probably the biggest hurdle. Uh, once that happened, then they moved on. We worked in, in almost a uh, step-by-step fashion uh, to handle it. So it, it isn't sometimes for us just what they're able to give financially, and, and as always, a municipality only has so many programs in order to, to do, but we've received ample support through grant notifications, letters of support for the grants, the endorsement of it, uh, as well as a very good uh, collaboration. All the infrastructure up here in Adams is not owned by Berkshire Scenic. It is owned by the town with a lease to Berkshire Scenic for operation and, and general maintenance. And it's been a painless process, and most of that occurred even long before I was town administrator up here. So it, it's just a, a buy-in required from the community that they want to partner and that they, they want to do work on this historic uh, property. Uh, they want to do it. it. It's vital to have those relationships. Thank you. Um, that That is all the questions that were in the chat. Um, I don't Can know, I no, ask I a I'll question? Uh, sure. So my name is Jeff Singleton. I'm on the uh, Montague Historic Commission. Um, thanks for this. This has been pretty amazing. And I got to tell you, uh, my mind is somewhat boggled that there's an H.H. H. Richardson uh, building and a, um, a uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Park in Palmer. I mean, I just I can't tell you how many times I've driven by Palmer and not paid much attention to Palmer. And I, I had no idea. Um, I guess I wanted to put in a quick pitch for um, paying attention places like Montague that don't have great train stations, but may have historic sites that are a little bit more of a lower level that we might be able to preserve and have on our maps and encourage. I mean, we have a couple of stops on the east west, one in Miller's Falls that's right near a old hotel building that's being rehabbed. Uh, I don't think it was a train station there, but I think there's, it's good to, it, it's important for us to encourage people who go into Miller's Falls or who live there to be aware of the train stop, which, you know, the local legend is Teddy Roosevelt stopped there and gave a speech there, that kind of stuff. Montague Center um, has a stop that you kind of go off into the woods and you, you walk out to it and you realize you're at an east-west railroad train stop that people literally used to take to go to Boston. There's no train station there, but it's kind of this obscure, ultra cool place that if it were, there were some good directions or signage, you know, people could go take a look at. So I just, I wanted to put in a pitch for other towns maybe that don't have the ability for more ambitious projects, paying attention to their local train you know, their local train history, because there's ways, there's ways of doing this, especially with the local historical commissions. Um, but I, I really appreciate this. Can I get a tape of this thing? Sure, we have a recording and we'll be able to share that out to attendees afterwards. Yeah, I just wanted to put in a pitch for lower level stuff. Yeah, I, thank I, you. As far as the um, Stacia can, I'm sure she could chime in, but I, it, I think we'll be posting it to the um, uh, Preservation Massachusetts has a spot where they'll post a link for the for the presentation afterwards. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Beth. Um, we do on our um, the Preservation Massachusetts website, which is um, preservationmass.org. We have um, if you go on the website and there's a link to partnerships. If you go into partnerships, there's Western Mass Historical Commission Coalition, and if you click on that. There's an archive of most, if not all, of the presentations that 
um, this group has had since 2014. Um, and um, with the permission of all the presenters today, we will also upload that today's presentation to that. And so it will live there and be available. And I believe it's also will be available on our U YouTube channel. Um, so definitely um, presentations like this are invaluable for those of us who've been able to have the opportunity to participate today, but also in the future. Great, thank you. Stacia, any other um, wrap up items that you have as we near the end of our time here this morning? I think really just to thank everyone who's participated in this meeting today, um, especially our presenters, without you um, sharing your passion um, your blood, sweat, and tears um, of, your, of your projects. Um, things don't happen um, without people like you. Um, and so thank you for, you know, sharing the, the how and how you, you made things happen. Um, as our group, um, as a group, we do like to meet several times a year. Um, and I thank all of the partners in the regional planning as well, agencies, as well as Chris Skelly for um, working together as a steering committee. We as a steering committee are always looking for ideas for upcoming presentations. Um, so if any of you um, on this um, meeting today or in the future um, have ideas, please reach out to us and let us know about projects that should be featured at future future um, meetings, um, because we're always um, looking for projects that can serve as models and inspiration. Um, and there's a lot of amazing things that are happening across the Commonwealth um, that we really would like to, to, to share with everyone. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being local advocates in your own communities, in your own region. Um, without you, nothing would be happening. Okay. Um, we will share information about the next session as soon as it's available and make sure that you are on the distribution list for that with Stacia. And if no one has anything else from the committee, I think we are all set for today. I want to echo the thanks to our presenters and look forward to seeing you all in, at a future session. Thank you. All right. Thank you very thanks, much. Thanks, everybody.